Hey you guys, today we're going to be talking about the Federalist Papers, the Brutus Papers, and how the Constitution became a thing. But before we talk about any of that, we need a little bit of background information. This is why the concept of continuity is so important to the study of history. We've got to understand the context to get the larger picture. So, stuff you need to know before we start. So the American Revolution had already happened and the United States was a thing, but we didn't have a president. Our good friend George Washington hadn't taken office yet because under the Articles of Confederation, there wasn't an executive branch, so there wasn't a president. Speaking of the Articles, those were the first constitution of the United States. We were mid-revolution and we declared independence and we knew that we needed a government but honestly, the only thing we really knew was what we didn't really want to do, which was become a tyrannical government, like what we thought Britain was. So we went the entire opposite direction and we created a federal government that had very, very little power. The articles couldn't do much of anything. They were kind of like the prequel to the constitution set before the first movie, not nearly as good, still had some of the same dudes in it, but like didn't make nearly as much money. The Articles of Confederation didn't provide for a strong central government, and some people had problems with that. For example, when people started losing their farms to foreclosures, they threw down in Shays' Rebellion, and it scared the elite. It became clear that when anything hit the fan, the federal government wasn't equipped to deal with it, and people like shitstarter extraordinaire Sam Adams from the Revolution argued that it was a problem. Ironically, even though he was at the forefront of the American Revolution tarring and feathering folks, once he and his friends were in power, he thought people shouldn't rebel and they should listen to authority. You know, as long as the authority was him. So he wanted there to be more authority and people like him pushed for the articles to be amended. But there was a problem with that. Amendments to the articles required a unanimous vote. Have you ever tried to get an entire group of people to agree on something? Let me tell you. It's not easy. There was this one time when I lived with roommates, we had a dinner group chat and my roommate sent a message asking if we wanted her to make nachos or tacos. All right, so first of all, let me just clarify that nachos are basically just broken tacos. So it's not like we're arguing life or death here. It's basically the same thing, but we couldn't get a unanimous decision to save our lives. We ended up eating meatloaf that night. I don't really know how it happened, but there you go. So that's how the Constitution ends up being born. So the Constitutional Convention gathered in May of 1787 to address the issues with the Articles of Confederation and the problems that resulted from having such a weak central government. What resulted was the creation of an entirely new document that made a new, stronger central government that was broken down into the judicial, executive, and legislative branches. Once the proposed Constitution went to the states for ratification, though, a furious debate began between those in favor of its passage, the Federalists, and those who opposed the Constitution and a stronger central government known as the Anti-Federalists. The Federalist Papers came about because opposition to the ratification of the Constitution was especially strong in New York. Anti-Federalists published documents to criticize the Constitution, and these are called the Brutus Papers, arguing that the proposed Constitution could actually hurt American liberties that were fresh in everyone's minds since the Revolution had only ended about a decade prior. Alexander Hamilton was a lawyer and a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. He wanted to write a set of essays to promote the Constitution's ratification, and he enlisted the aid of John Jay, who had been Secretary of Foreign Affairs under the Articles, and he helped negotiate the Treaty of Paris to end the Revolution. Revolution. So pretty important dude, right? And obviously he's pretty persuasive. So together they convinced James Madison, delegate to the convention that's often referred to as the father of the Constitution, to help write as well. The Federalist Papers first appeared in the Independent Journal under the pseudonym Publius. Um, the reason for that is because they wanted to avoid some awkward questions about the convention's confidentiality. The name comes from a general who helped found the Roman Republic. They supported a strong national government and the ratification of the Constitution. The Federalist Papers ended up being published over a period of time in several New York newspapers from 1787 to 88. The first 77 essays also were published in a book that was entitled The Federalist, um, and this became one of the most important political documents in U.S. history and trust me, there are a lot of them, so pretty significant. Hamilton himself wrote 51 out of the 85 total essays. One of the things the Federalist Papers did was lay down the reasons that the Articles of the Confederation 
didn't work. Um, they said that the federal government had very limited power under the articles. They decentralized power by ensuring that the states had more power than the central government. This in turn kept the United States from being strong enough to compete on the world stage or even ensure domestic peace. Remember I talked before about Shea's rebellion where you had at the end of it calls for a stronger central government by the elite class. They realized that without a central government who had the ability to step in in times of crisis or rebellion, um, rebellions would become the new norm. And anytime the people were dissatisfied, that would be what they did. Whether that was a benevolent idea or something that was selfish because the elite wanted to maintain the status quo and stay in power, we're not really gonna look at too closely right now. Either way, people were convinced that we needed a stronger central government. All right, so I want to go through a couple of the major Federalist Papers. Now remember, there are a lot of them, so we're not going to go through all of them. Um, we're not going to read through all of them, but I did want to give you some big points of some of the huge ones. So first, we have Federalist Number 1. Federalist Number 1 is pretty much the best essay introduction of all time. So in this one, Alexander Hamilton lays out some of the issues that other peoples will have with the Constitution, and he kind of rebuttals them and lays down the major arguments in favor of it. In Federalist 10, James Madison warns against the dangers of factions. A faction is a group of citizens with a common interest. So something like the NRA today. Um, they promote their own special interests, which is good for them, but they're often at odds with each other and they can work against public interest in favor of their own interest. Madison says that liberty means there will be factions, but we can control the effects of them through Republican government, which is different than a direct democracy. Um, then we've got Federalist 51. In 51, uh, we get an explanation of the constitutional safeguards against concentration of power. Um, there's the argument that government is necessary because people are fallible and no group should possess too much power. So we come up with the idea of checks and balances. And then finally, in Federalist 84, Hamilton talks about his views on adding a Bill of Rights. His argument is that the Constitution already guarantees all of our rights that aren't specifically taken. So he thought a Bill of Rights was actually dangerous and unnecessary because it would place limitations on our rights. So those are the Federalist Papers and a little bit about the Brutus Papers. I'll see you guys next time.